Okay, friends, Romans, Huntsman, lend me your ears. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Wagen. I am the secretary of the Citizens for Direct Democracy. It happens that today is a strangely vicious day. Uh, firstly, we have some decent weather at last. Uh, secondly, anybody who read the papers today or saw the news noticed that the greatest representational government in the world, the USA, today ran out of money. And it can no longer pay its civil servants or its army. The other great thing from the news is that long last they have found a culprit and he has been found guilty in the great business of the gas-fired generators. About time too. The only trouble is it isn't McGinley they got. This meeting is all about democracy, true democracy. And this is the common thread running through all the presentations. Now, I will start by talking about the basic principles, then discuss some of the serious problems we face when we as a people lose control. I will emphasize the loss of control by our representatives, the rise of power of bureaucracies, and the peril of public debt. There are many speakers today, and I will introduce them at the appropriate times, and I will provide a little background to them. I also will refer to several books. That may seem unusual, but this meeting today is part of a long history, and people need to know that very intelligent professionals and academics have seen this day coming. Um, so, let us start. Direct democracy is founded on one principle, and that is the right of people to control their own future. We often speak about fundamental rights, but all those rights, the freedom of speech, of assembly, of the press, of religion, all rest on that one basic principle that we must be free to choose our own future. We all know that deep in our hearts, this principle is the very soul and spirit of the human race. But who actually enforces these rights? It is the government. When the government does not grant these rights, then the social fabric comes apart. For example, China calls itself a democracy because it has elections. In practice, it is run by a single autocratic party. The result is the suppression of the people. In Canada, we are run by the leader of the winning political party. It is a legislative dictatorship. We can't do much about it, except change the dictator once every four years. And the same is true for the city of Guadalajara Lakes. Party politics was never designed to help the people. It's all about power, privilege, and a heavy purse. Politics comes from the Greek word polis, meaning rule by the state. And we've had enough of that. Democracy comes from demos. It means people power, the direct rule of the people, and we've had very little of that. Lincoln put it so well at Gettysburg, and I assure you all know these more immortal words, the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Unfortunately, it did perish, but we intend to bring it back. Representational government is not democracy. It is a gentle form of tyranny, but tyranny nonetheless. In a three-party system, we often end up with one party with less than 50% support running the show. That happened in the city of Guadalajara Lakes with the decision to reduce the number of councillors to eight. 
To refresh your memory on that despicable piece of manipulation, which as a mathematician it horrified me, only 293 people voted out of a population of 73,000. Of that group, that small group, only 43% voted for eight councillors. But that is the number we have. There's only one way, out, one way out of this political mess, a mess that creates monstrous debts and huge bureaucracies. It's for the people to take direct control. We must have a government that finds out the wishes of the people and makes them happen. Direct democracy works. Switzerland has a direct democracy government. There was a loose confederation of the Swiss cantons going back to the Middle Ages. It was updated in 1847. That's 170 years ago, before Canada was created, and it is still going strong. We hear of political battles in Germany, England, France, throughout Europe, Australia, and the USA, but we hear very little about Switzerland. It's hard to have a conflict with a government that only exists to carry out the will of the people. In Switzerland, which, as you know, is a very prosperous country, the people are the government. The power behind democracy is the wisdom of crowds. We all know that a rational discussion between a large number of people will always produce the best results. This is a matter of science. We have always known this. We usually call it common sense. Always say, many heads are better than one. <coughs> this ancient wisdom is something that humans have learned from thousands of years of experience. It's been confirmed many times by modern methods. This is the first book I want to show. It's called The Wisdom of Crowds. And it gives so many examples from the weirdest places like funded, finding sunken submarines and so on. And on the cover we have large groups of people are smarter than an elite few, no matter how brilliant. Large groups are better at solving problems, fostering innovation, coming to wise decisions, even predicting the future. So this is good science, with plenty of support from research. This is a, re a recent example from 2010. Two volunteer stock market investors were part of this experiment. Their individual performances were recorded over several weeks. Then they were told to cooperate with each other. Their performance improved dramatically. Now, I can see that nobody in this room finds that strange or unusual. It's exactly what you expect. But it is this very foundation, the wisdom of crowds and of democracy, that we're talking about. Somehow it seems that two brains have a neural interaction which creates one better brain. We don't know how it really works, but it helped the human race to survive and thrive. It works much better than looking for smart leaders. If you attend a council meeting, you will soon see this statistical truth. On average, 50% of the people in the gallery are smarter and more capable of running the city than the people sitting on council. That's a statistical truth. Sometimes it's a very obvious one. More recent studies show that animals use the wisdom of crowds as a survival strategy. A good example is the annual migration of the wildebeest and zebras. Now, zebras travel in a small herd with a leader. The head stallion decides when and where they will cross the river. He starts out and they follow him in single file. A bit like the city of Wild Lakes. The crocodiles pick them off with ease, one fatal disaster after another. 
and the vulgar beast just went around sharing information. Then all of a sudden they go for it like a threshing machine. The turmoil in the river, they know from experience, confuses the crocodiles so that very few of them are killed. Now running a municipality requires very trivial skills, one of which is simple arithmetic. Our videos, and we have a number of them, show that that skill is often missing. You all have the qualifications to run the city. You've got them by simply living. The idea that there is an administrative elite who deserves to rule you is absolute rubbish. Our city council handed over control to the bureaucrats. I personally appeared before council with a petition regarding the water rates. That was passed directly to staff without any input from council. And the precise words were that the petition be forwarded to staff for future budget considerations. That was the end of public input to the council. Not quite what we expected when we elected them. And I've yet to receive a reply from staff. And that was 18 months ago. So how did this happen? Why is it that we cannot beat City Hall? Let me tell you. In 2005, Council decided it needed a code of conduct for the Council and staff. In August 2007, Council got down to business. They had the option of creating a task force to draft the document of councillors. Now, they should have established a steering committee of citizens, since Council and staff must meet our standards. However, they told staff to develop the document. In 2009, staff began to write their own code of conduct to control their own conduct. Now we need to pause to let that sink in. I have only time to look at one issue, and that is who is really in charge. In 2009, staff wrote in this code of conduct, that chains of command must be respected. Every bureaucracy loves that, keeps everybody in their place. Now the revision in 2016 was quite different. Now it has an ominous tone. The new code was directed at the behaviour of councillors, not of staff, just councillors. Councillors shall acknowledge that only council as a whole shall direct members through the CAO to carry out specific tasks or functions. And again, no member has the authority to direct or interfere with the performance of any work being carried out by an employee of the city. That is really bureaucratic protectionism at the extreme. Now, councillors have to sign that document. You see this growth in power? The bureaucratic boa constrictor squeezing tighter? This again is no surprise. Parkinson's law, which you may have heard of, dates back to 1955. And it states that officials in bureaucracies aim to demand their own mini MPLs by hiring more staff. The extra staff focuses its energies on irrelevant details. Those details are ignored by successful organisations. So, we end up with a mayor and councillors who have no authority over the staff. A preposterous situation. But is it true? Unfortunately, yes. I asked one councillor to get me the increase in budgets for the last 10 years. He was unable to do so, although he tried three times. He did not have the authority to order anybody on staff to give him that information, and they declined. I asked the mayor to do something about the pebbles on my law. This is a kind of a sort of humorous story. It's a long story. We made a video about it. But a big snow cloud put a whole lot of pebbles on my law. 
I asked him, can I get something done about it? So there were fundamentally said, I can't do anything about it, but I can ask the actual roads manager if he can do something. Now, that situation must make the reeds of the former municipalities turn in their graves. Perhaps some of you knew personally some of the old reeds in the municipalities. In not all. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Peggy. <laughs> When, when, when those reeds spoke, including Faye, things happened. <laughs> now we are ruled by a paid employee who heads a bureaucracy. In the conduct code, which they made, there was no me mechanism for disciplining staff for making bad decisions. Now, isn't that a surprise? And worse, guess what? The CAO is responsible for the administration of this Bible. This is the same old problem with the police force investigating itself using its own rules. Now you may rest assured that the Direct Democracy Council and the people will soon write a new conduct code. Now bureaucracies and democracies are implacable enemies. They are at opposite poles regarding the basic structure of a decent human society. They have different viewpoints. Now, we already have a weak council and a strong bureaucracy. But I still cannot believe that council was duped into believing that fewer councillors would be good for the people and good for democracy. It was designed by staff to put more power into the hands of staff. And it has succeeded. Note that in the GTA, they increased their number of councillors. Now let me put this in perspective. Staff costs us $52 million a year. We pay $52 million a year for the staff of the City of Lakes. And by removing eight councillors, they have saved, they say they have saved $109,000, $109, okay? So they got rid of eight councillors and they saved that much money. Now that money is less than the salary of the town clerk. Does that mean that all those eight councillors who have sworn to act in our interest, it says that they're worth less than one senior employee? Now let me put in another why why we wait for Tim Swart and Coffee. The money they say will buy everybody in the city of Guadalajara Lakes a small coffee at Tim's. Are eight councillors only worth a cup of coffee to us? They voted for this change. So my conclusion is those councillors have such a low self esteem that they themselves feel that what they do for us is only worth a cup of coffee. This is a deplorable state. Now, the cost of staff bureaucracy has increased tremendously. At the time of amalgamation, there were just two people earning more than 100,000 a year. Now we have 108, 108 people earning more than 100,000 for the service we get. Now these are the so-called experts who believe that they have special skills and thus they should tell us what to do. It pays to remember that the Titanic was built by professional nautical engineers. You know what happened to that? On the other hand, the ark that survived the Great Flood was built by Noah, who you please know was actually a farmer. Perhaps some of you ran a lemonade stand when you were kids. If you did, then I have to tell you that you're overqualified to be a counsellor. <laughs> now, does, does that sound outrageous? Let me explain. A lemonade stand has to satisfy its customers. The city does not. The lemonade stand has a product that creates income. The city does not. Not even a toothpick. The lemonade stand has competitors just down the road. That keeps efficiency up and prices down. The city does not. 
But, and this is very important, real life activities have a bottom line. Where the money runs out and they go out of business. The city does not. It just takes out another huge loan on the backs of the working people of Victoria County. Let me give two examples. Council set the maximum debt load for the water and sewage utility at $49.5 million. Nobody's allowed to go beyond that. Now we, as taxpayers, expect that the debt will be paid off by reducing the capital. But that is not the case. Suppose that in one year we reduce the capital by two million, so we're going to go from 49.5 down to 47.5. Start immediately borrowers of another two million to take it back up to 49.5 million. So they do this year after year. The interest we have paid keeps growing and the debt remains the same. Now again, you can see this explained in detail on one of our videos. The second example is the low cost housing project. The original project was going to be $8 million paid for on a 20 year debenture. Now, if you know debentures, it really means that the city's gone to a bank or something, said, so lend us $8 million and we don't have any security, but we promise you, we promise you, we will get it out of the taxpayer somehow or other. That's how a debenture works. Now, what went wrong? The estimate was wrong by $4.3 million. So now, we've gone from 8 million debenture to 12.3 uh, 12 million. Now, that was a massive blunder by someone on staff. However, the bureaucrats keep their jobs, and we keep paying. Now, the staff came up with a neat solution to this. They said, right, the debenture over 20 years, okay, for 8 million, what we would do is we will expand the timeline to 30 years for 12.3 million. Now, we've all faced this when we buy cars and mortgages, and I guess, Farmers with no farm equipment, you get into that situation. So I did the calculations. The interest we would have paid for the 20 year adventure was $2.6 million, which in itself is a lot of money. The interest on the 30 years was 6.4. So the interest we pay is increased by 3.8 million. But we already had a 4.3 million overrun on the thing to start with. So now we're 4.3 plus 3.8, which is 8.1 million. So the project which was going to cost us 8 million is now costing us 16 million. This is what the staff is doing, and this is what the city councillors are endorsing. And we've seen it before in the hydro rates were recently decreased in order to keep the voters happy. The long-term cost is a huge debt to be paid off well into the future plus interest charge, charges, which I read as $21 billion. It'd be the job of some other government and the next generation of taxpayers to sort out that first. So, were we the people consulted when the city took out $25 million in our name? Were we consulted when they expended the debentures on 20 years to 30 years? Did we vote for the city to go into the airport business? Yes, we need a landing circle for medical helicopters. But an extra runway only benefits the people who can afford a plane or to travel by air. And I bet the citizens waiting at the bus stop in the middle of winter really appreciate this extravagance which is paid out by their taxes with their bus fares going up. Did we approve the policy of rolling over debt so that we, our children and grandchildren, will always be in debt? And at the provincial level, were we consulted about the sale of Hydro One? And what about the cancellation of gas fired power stations? That was a purely political decision to grab votes. 
It had nothing to do with common sense. We had no input. Yet it cost us almost one billion dollars. Now the city would say we cannot go back to small local councils. But let's remember they worked extremely well. Fourteen of them had no debt. They had surpluses that were swallowed up by the city. There is nothing worse than having your savings stolen. Savings that you scrape together by many years of fiscal restraint. We are now standing on the edge of a financial precipice just like the United States. Now Bill Holmes will point out other heavy debts that I have not mentioned. And under these circumstances, it is prudent, in fact it is vital, that we return to a safer position. That means creating small local councils that are driven by direct democracy. This is a moral imperative that must be, not be ignored. The days of pay and obey must end. We, the taxpayers, pay the piper. It is time for us to call the tune. So that is the end of my comments before we introduce the next speaker. Thanks very much. Um, our next speaker is John Snyder. He's a friend of mine. I call him Big John. He's the treasurer of our Citizens of Direct Democracy Group. And he has a very keen eye for the wastage of money, time, resources, and anything else that increases our taxes. He will give one example of what has happened in a decentralized system that ignores the wisdom of crowds, the wisdom of people who actually live in a specific locality. So John, tell us about what you experienced right outside your front door. Well, my name is John Snyder, as you heard, and I am the treasurer for Citizens for Direct Democracy. Peter has provided an important overview of some of the problems in the city. I want to look more closely at one example. In Broad Cajun, to us it is known as the Nightmare on Main Street. Main Street is one of the oldest roads in Broad Cajun. It connects the area just north of the locks, known as Market Square, to County Road 36. It is a busy road, and it will become more so as the development goes along Front Street West. The city's plan was to dig up the road, replace existing storm water pipes and drains, replace sidewalks, and generally bring the road up to a standard. The existing services laid in the mid-1970s. They served the village well through their expected life, at that time, there were no engineering departments, and plans from those days are still available. We now have 24 people in the engineering department. In 2015, the personal costs were about $1 million. Those costs have doubled in 2016. Now the cost is approaching $2.5 million for that department. That massive department does not do work. It only has one function, and that is to oversee the projects. I want to emphasize that responsibility. This is an actual wording from a city document. It is the responsibility of the engineering department to oversee all design, construction, and major maintenance on public highways, bridges, sewers, water mains, and other related infrastructure. The blueprints for, main, for the Main Street construction were produced by Wills Engineering. The construction work was done by Dream Brothers, specializing in this kind of work. In due time, the designs for the construction were ready and sent to the city engineering department. They were approved. From there, they went to Dream Brothers, and work started in uh, March of 2017. All of this activity took, its, took place right outside my home and business on Main Street. Our chairman, Steve Clark, who also lives on Main Street, he also had a very close view of the construction. 
we soon began to see some strange things happen. As we looked north, up Main Street, the road seemed to slope down from the east to the west. As we looked south towards Market Square, the road seemed to slope down from the west to the east. <laughs> So we took our video camera and we mounted it on a tripod in the middle of the road. Set the axis absolutely vertical by using a clump off. <clears throat> and the difference in the height of curves was now obvious as we scanned from side to side. There were only a few explanations for a blunder like that. Either the construction workers who misread the blueprints, or there was an error on the plans. If there was an error on the plans, then it must have been done during the drawing stage and missed by city staff. So much for oversight. The cost to correct that mistake must have been thousands of dollars. But the city does not reveal any detail about the cost of the original project, nor the additional cost of correcting errors. One day I saw trucks arriving to remove fill from the roadbed. I made it a bit of a habit to ask questions of, about the construction. Apparently, the road was being set to a new grade level as it was too high. After tons of fill were removed and graders came in to do their work, I thought asphalting would now proceed. So I was a bit surprised when a few days later, trucks brought the fill back <laughs> again. The service was then regraded once more. More time wasted, more cost to the taxpayer. <coughs> So we now have a new problem not foreseen in the planning stages. Some properties had their entrances blocked by a low rock shelf which had become exposed. This had to be corrected. About 500 feet of recently poured concrete curb had to be removed. The road grade had to be reset and new curbs laid. Other entrances had curb right across the entrance. So later on, those had to be cut down well, not for driveway entrances. Uh, I pointed out these things to the contractor and, and experienced workmen, and the reply was that they were not to use common sense. Just do the job as per engineer drawings. The original pipes were set deep down. The new pipes were set much closer to the surface. It was pointed out by the contractor but they would likely freeze in the winter. So once again, planning was poor. The solution was to put a styrofoam blanket on top of the pipes. More expense and more wasted time. Some of the old pipes ran under the sidewalk. This could be seen on the infrastructure maps from the village of Bob Cajun. However, that information was not shared by the city with the contractor. Once discovered, the pipes needed to be removed to avoid the side of the lot collapse. This meant more work, more expense, and more time lost. Thus, the deadline for reopening the road on June 1st slipped past. A pla the place between the curb and the sidewalk was removed. That means the snow plow now pushes snow right onto the sidewalk, which makes it difficult for pedestrians. The solution will be extra plowing of the sidewalk or snow removal. Again, these are both expensive operations that should have been obvious to the planners and to the city engineers. This is what happens when a centralized group makes decisions without the wisdom of the locals. We cannot afford any more fiascos like the nightmare on Main Street. Under a direct democracy, the people are involved all the time. All financial transactions are open to public scrutiny all the time. It is time for change. Please support your direct democracy candidates this falls in this fall's election for real change. Thank you. The next uh, two speakers represent uh, VOCA, the Voices of Central Ontario. That organization came to life around 2000. Its purpose was to prevent amalgamation. At that time, amalgamation was seen as the cure for the mess created by Harris and other politicians, particularly in the TTA. 
Uh, this ideology only lasted eight years, but we are a major victim. This massive disruption was made by just one person, Harry Kitchen. It's interesting that he reduced us to a one-tier government, but Peabara, where he lives, he left as two tiers. Now, Faye McGee is a well-known figure in municipal affairs. Faye was a prominent councillor, an outspoken voice for the people, and had her own column in the paper. Bill Holmes here is an active member of OCO. He gathers facts and figures and reports that reveal the dark side of local government. Together they will paint for us a picture of life before the kitchen sink fell on us. I was never there. She was there. She was good at it. Uh, like, I'm going to start off like, uh, in our election in 2010, in, uh, we had 72,000 people, that's what our population, and we had valid voters of 56, the total voters was 57, that's in the thousands, and we had a rejected vote of 810 votes in our little community here. And in the federal election in 2011, they only had 163. The provincial election, they only had 88. So I can't figure out how we had 810 unless they just want to figure out who they want to put in. Okay, now, when you jump on to our utility invoice, in 2014, I think that's when they started the trunk for Lindsay. And the fixed water was 55, your sewer was 53, your, mixed wa uh, your metered water was 31, your sewer was 19, and then you had a capital levy of, of 481 and a dollar 85. And now we come up to 2017, our water has gone up, which everybody knows, it's on the meter. But our capital levy is 2025, and our sewer is 1816. Now, when they put this capital levy on, they've they done that before when, the, when the, the fire department overspent. So they just stick it on your taxes. It's a levy. So if you look up what a levy is, it's just a tax on a tax. So that's, that's what they're doing to us, and we would like to be able to get out of it. And then uh, in, in 2016, the bylaw was posed the, the special allowance for drainage water upon the land in respect to the, which money is borrowed for the tile drainage act. Now, I knew the farmers would know what that is if they're here and they've been paying for it, and I would assume they're still paying for it. And then in, in, uh, in the same, in 2016, they had a bylaw that, that is for, it's on debentures, and they want to borrow, they borrowed 5,985,000 403 and 68 cents. I don't know why they need cents. And in the same meeting, they've done the same thing again, only they borrowed 14 million. And this is all for various projects. And that, that was in, in 16 of November. And then in 17, they borrowed another 25 million for various projects. And these are all on debentures, which Peter was talking about. And they're going to keep on extending them debentures. <laughs> and then uh, I'm going to go just about finish here, people. And then the trailer park in Bob Cage. Now they're going to decommission the trailer park, and it's going to cost 45000 to decommission. And we have a person in one of the upper chambers looking after that. So she's hired a consultant for $200,000 to tell her how to do it. <laughs> On my last topic there, in 1999, just before we were put into a one-tier system, all it cost was to run Victoria County was $187,793.39. That's to run 16 communities, your Reeves, your councillors, and the upper tier. Now we have one person that makes that much money. And everybody that's sitting in the upper tier on our last average that we looked at, each person is taking home $13,000 of our money. So thank you very much. Okay, I'm not sure just why I'm here other than probably piss you off even more than they have. <laughs> um, and, and I do want, and I know there's things being talked about that maybe some of you aren't interested in, but you've got to stay and listen. Um, I said to one woman, Liz Riches, or Liz Marshall was sitting at the back, that she was the smartest woman I ever met. That was a shot at me. 
Okay, so I'm going to change that. So she's one of the sharpest women I've ever met. Uh, we're arguing about which one's the better bitch, and I know I have a shirt that says that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I had a shirt I was going to wear, but I didn't want to offend some of you. <laughs> okay, so let's get started on what I'm going to do to get you going here. All right? Back in the good old days of Victoria County, you could drive up to my house, to my counselor's house, you go to your municipal office, you could tell them about an issue. Not going to say they fixed everything perfect, but they sure as hell did a better job than what's happening today. Okay? Now you got somebody sitting on council, and let's just say that they live at Fowler's Corner. They're deciding on an issue for a person at Seabright. They probably can't even drive to Seabright, they don't know where it is. But they're making that decision. I'm going to bet most of you people from the Victoria County days can all tell me that when you went to your counselor's house or your local council meeting or your local municipal office, somebody actually came to your property and took a look at what the hell was going on before they went back and voted. It doesn't happen now. Now, they're absolutely right staffed. Everybody knows I was on the state council for a while, and it's staff. You don't have any rights. The elected official can't do squat, okay? Um, and you know, they're talking about what the council cost you before. Let, let's just go to Sturgeon Point for a minute. Sturgeon Point was free. They never got paid. They got a check at Christmas for 50 bucks as a donation from Sturgeon Point to them for what they did all year, and they donated it back. So Sturgeon Point's council didn't cost them a dime. Our council cost a very little. Okay, so now let's go to the, and, and none of us had, there was only two municipalities that had any debt. When Harry Kitchen got put in here, Harry Kitchen got paid $80,000 by the, the province to do what he did here. Let's just say Harry Kitchen and I didn't do too well together, okay? In the meantime, he sent a bill to Victoria County before the mistake got here and wanted an additional $12,000. Victoria County Council said no. He resubmitted that bill with the first term of the mistake council. He got it. They paid it because they don't care. You're going to pay your taxes. If you don't, the next guy will. They don't care about who you are, what you have, or what you don't have. So now we have more debt. And I love when they'll say to you, somebody will say to you, we got a $90 million debt. No, no, we don't. No, no, no. No, it's only $30 million. Okay. That's because what they do is they break it down. They do not classify, when you ask them a question, user pay as debt. So your water and sewer that's paid for by those of you that are on water and sewer, that's your debt, but it's not mine because I'm not on it. So that's how they get away with saying, that only have this much debt when there's really this much because they're calling that a user pay system. Well, I don't care if it's on my Visa or my MasterCard, debt to debt, regardless of what you call it. Okay, but they get away with doing that. Now we've got less services. We all know that. Uh, you see a small problem when you don't need to see it, and then you don't see it when you do need to see it. Okay. <laughs> now they have this, I, I love the way they work now too, they're dictators. Okay. They have a meeting the other night in Little Britain to talk to the people there about the possible closure of the Little Britain and Oakwood Fire Hall. I said to the people, are they going to listen to you or are they going to tell you? The people went. One lady was crying because of the time it's going to take for response now. One man said his property insurance is going to go up $300 a year. They don't care about that. They didn't go to discuss it. They went to tell them. I thought we were elected official, and there's a few of them in here, Jack, Jack McLaren from Queen's Park. I thought you're supposed to represent the people, not dictate to them. That was my take on it when I was there, unless something's changed. But, and they believe that's right. Now they want to spend $1.6 million to build a new fire hall. The fire halls they have are what you in your communities built when they were small communities. You had volunteers <coughs> participate. You don't have that anymore. There isn't the private community because we don't get any benefit of what we're doing anymore. Everything goes their way. That's all there is to it. I'm gonna, and I'm going to drag this on a little longer than anybody wants me to, but I'm going to do for a reason. I got asked if I'd come back on the cemetery board in town because they were having trouble with one of the elected officials. And uh, I did. Anyway, that elected official went crying that he got picked on and he got removed. And uh, so they sent a couple other elected officials in. I started asking, where's the cemetery's money? Before amalgamation, the village of Fennel Falls had in their budget cemetery money that went to the volunteer cemetery. All right? We haven't gotten any money. What do you mean you haven't gotten any money? Well, we haven't gotten any money since the amalgamation. But you should be getting money. 
So I turned to the two elected officials that are now there because I'm such a bitch, okay? And I asked them, and one of them tells me, there is no budget for cemetery. That's bullshit. All the cemeteries you got in this mistake we live in, you don't have any money in a budget for cemeteries. Well, they go back and look again. They came back the next time and they told us we didn't get any because we're volunteers. If we walked away and let employees take over that cemetery, then there would be money going to Fountain Falls. I said, okay, you get me that in writing, because I'm going to go public so the people in Fountain Falls know that when they pay their taxes, none of their money is going to their cemetery. It's going to Dunsford, Cocom, Norland, Kenmont, where, but not going to Fountain Falls, because not one dime has come to Fountain since the nomination. They couldn't get me that in writing, but we now get $10,000 a year. <laughs> they won't retro it. I tried to make them go back. <laughs> Okay, so now we got the Sunshine Club. We got over 80 people that are making over $100,000 a year. We're paying for it. It's our money. I guess what frustrates me the most is we start taking a look. They close libraries, okay? They close the fire halls. Um, you know, see, all the little things that we managed to accomplish with no debt in our communities, volunteers, lottery grants, whatever it was, we did them all. And now they want to eliminate them. What I don't get, and this is I'm going to get Paul Arkwright's attention here, because properties that were donated to Paul for recreational purposes to municipalities and agreements signed, those properties would be donated by families to Femlin Falls or to Maripas or wherever it is. They've got them up for sale now. How can they do that? Those were donated to those municipalities. Limited, right, Paul? Okay, so the one down here, and I know Paul is here too. But right now, they'd they like to sell that property where the old arena was to the farmer's market. Not arguing with them, but I'm saying, how can they just do this? It was donated to the village for a certain purpose. Then we get to the limited services agreement. Sorry, Colleen. They don't want to sell it to the farmer's market. They want to sell it for development. They, there you go. That's what they really want to do. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. And you're right. They want to sell it to development. They, they put in the paper about the farmer's market, but it's more to cover their house than anything. Okay, so the people like me don't complain. That's all it is. But you're right. Thanks, Molly. So I said, I, I don't understand how they can legally do this. They want to cut out the limited service agreements that we all have for roads and so on. I don't know how they can do that. Those are signed legal agreements. So I'm not sure how they can get away with that either. I didn't write a speech, guys. I just make notes so that I don't forget to tell you something, okay? Uh, let me see. Where are we at? We fought back. This group of vocal, I started before Harry Kitchen got here. As soon as I found out he was coming, I called Michael Smithers, who was the Municipal World Editor of the Municipal World Magazine, and I called Hazel McCown, and I said, what do we do? They both told me, fight. Michael Smithers came and stayed here for two or three days. He said, never give up. And don't let them tell you that you can't get out of it. I get frustrated because people don't want to get involved until it personally affects them. And that's wrong. You either support what we had or you support what we've got. If you think what we've got is wonderful and you like paying those taxes, which I find interesting ever since we amalgamated, we're supposed to see money, right? <laughs> and yet yeah, every year we've had tax increases. You know that tax increases? Because I know I have. Now this year we're supposed to be excited because it's only 3.8. They got it down from 4.8. We're lucky. <laughs> Old crap. Okay. So we had our referendum. Now this is the only place we differ. There are other areas, other communities that want the amalgamation. Montreal did. Montreal did amalgamate. Professor Andrew Saint can help them. Um, there's a gentleman, Robert McDermott. I don't know if he's here or not. He was going to try and come. He's from Scarborough. Um, they're trying in Scarborough. He would like us to come to a meeting there on February 26th. So we're not crazy here. The only difference between us and them is that we did have a vote. We had a referendum that we won. Now, I went to the landowners meeting that was held at the Admiral back in November. And one gentleman said something to me, not that they weren't all smart there, but something. I asked him what I'm missing. There's something I'm missing. Because we have the video where the MPP spoke on behalf of the government of the day. They would honor the vote of the people. We have the letter from Dalton McGinty, who was running at that time, that they would honor the vote of the people. They have a motion on council passed. Move by me, carry, 
that they, we demand from some of the vote of the people. And then along comes John Garrison, who was on council at that or on, on the Queen's Park, and he says, not at this time. So I guess my question is, when? What time? He didn't say no. He said, not at this time. So is this the right time? It's going to have to mean people stand up. I mean, it's all funny when we're telling you about the money they're wasting, but that's your money. Now, come on, guys. If that was your wife spending that kind of money at home, you'd be on it. <laughs> right? And come on, women, if they're right buying all that kind of booze, you'd be on that. So I'm asking you to protect your tax dollars. That's all I'm trying to do. And then people say, well, you can't go back, pay. It would cost too much money. The Municipal Act gives you 75% of the cost. And who the hell cares what it's going to cost you? You think this is going to keep getting better going this way? So, to me, it's a very simple issue, but they want to turn it into something where they're trying to scare it. Scare, it's going back. So I'm saying it is a matter of going back. I'm saying let's go in the future the right way. People stand up together and fight back. And now I'm going to shut up, leave you alone, and let the other people tell you what they know they do better than I do. I got it. Let me. Thanks, thanks so much for me. I, I always enjoy listening to Faye speak. She is so full of energy. She's a real work on tour and the best students that work. Also thanks Bill for those nasty frags that now have seen in the light of day. Okay. The, the the last speaker before we break for coffee and Tim Bits is uh, Steve Clark. Steve is the chair of the Citizens of Direct Democracy, and uh, in his job, he's uh, very well positioned to hear the complaints of the citizens. He's, he's the best barber around. So, uh, he's also a, a prolific writer to the press and uh, to the uh, citizens everywhere, and to council, and to the mayor. And, uh, I compliment them because he really gets under their skin. Yeah. Well, thank you, Peter, for that uh, prolific welcome. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to welcome you all here this afternoon on a wonderfully sunny day. It's kind of a break in the weather. Uh, as Peter said, my name is Steve Clark, and I'm the Chair for Citizens for Direct Democracy. And uh, I would like to talk about the future, uh, solutions and remedies. Now, I like the word remedy because that is akin to a cure. Because what we seem to have today are prescriptions. And prescriptions is the code for one size fits all. So can you imagine for a second just going into a shoe store and there is one style and one size, a size 10. You can see right away there's not going to be too many happy customers. So, I don't know about you, but I don't know how many times I've talked to my councillor, my MP, my MPP, with some issue or another, and I've been given some pat answer, or when information does come, it's filled with platitudes and promises, or even better, it doesn't come at all, which I might add, it's the number one complaint of the city of Quarter Lakes that they just don't respond to your uh, inquiries. So it can be seen that creating change as far as government is concerned is a soul destroying task and massive amounts of effort ought to often result in micro return regarding real change. So okay, let's accept that. Let's accept that you cannot change government from the outside. I'm just going to say that again, you cannot change government from the outside. So how do we solve that problem? Good question. Well, Citizens for Direct Democracy want to run a candidate in every ward and a mayoral candidate. Now, I'll be running in Ward 6, John will be running in Ward 2, and Bill Holmes is going to be running uh, for mayor of City Quarter Lakes. Woohoo! <laughs> we're going to run on a common platform, and we do have a plan, okay? It's called the Roadmap for Change. This is a complete platform of transforming City Quarter Lakes to more or less back to where we were when we started. Okay, here are some highlights from that plan. One, bureaucratic reform. Two, the use of referendum for all major decisions. Three, the introduction of transparency. Fancy that. And four, a plan to steadily decentralize local governments. We were served well by a two-tier system of government, and Peterborough still is. Now comes the good bit. We need volunteers. We need people to step up and run in these wards. Okay, there will be eight councillors and one mayor position available. We have three people, 
Uh, so, so there's six places, six people we need to stand up and uh, uh, come forward and um, about 20 volunteers who will do phone calls, putting up signs, all that invaluable groundwork uh, that we can't uh, do without and to support each other and to get these candidates elected onto our council so we can take it back and take back democracy <coughs> into our communities, as been said, we paid for and built ourselves. So why now? I, I believe this is a critical time, and I think everyone sitting in this room today, when you look at your hydro bills, when you look at your water and sewer bills, when you look at your food bills, when you look at your energy bills, when you look at your property tax bills, these things are all going up at a rate of knots, and it's become more and more clear that John Q. Public has nothing to say except cough up, pay, and obey. So this is where it all starts, folks. It starts sort of right in your community where all of these things affect you the most. How many community centres do we need to lose? How many fire stations do we need to lose? How many libraries? And it's going to happen. They do this bit by bit. Uh, uh, basically, everything is going to go down to Lindsay, and we're going to be spokes on that hub. And they won't do it all at once, because they know that if they do it all at once, you'll get really upset. So they do it a little bit here, and a little bit there, and they hope that they can quell the dissent, uh, like they did in Little Britain, by just presenting rather than actually asking for your input. Okay, so as Peter said, uh, we've been making some videos about some very serious issues with the city. These are incredible videos, they're well documented, and they really outline the problem where your tax dollars are going. And you know, every time I go to a, a meeting with Andy Latham, there's always a question about the roads. When are you going to fix my parlor? When are we going to fix the infrastructure? Now you know why. There's no money. Senior staff is completely sucking it up in planning uh, and this kind of stuff instead of actually spending it on the real issues. And you probably noticed in the paper that we got $36,000 for um, Highway 36, okay, it being a whole route, for a study. <laughs> okay, it's not, it's not going into the highway. It's going to, we're going to study the impact of the changing of Highway 36 into a whole route. Uh, so, we really do need to stand up, to stand up to the plate and realise that this is coming to your front door and if we don't do something now, it's just going to steal. I, I think if we, if we wait till the next election, pass, it's another four years, it'll be too late. You will not have a voice, you will not be able to go to City Hall and, and state your claims. Okay, so uh, just a little mention, I am videotaping this uh, presentation uh, for people who couldn't make it here today, so we're going to have a question and answer period. And when that happens, uh, if you could, when you ask a question, please stand up and speak clearly so we can all hear. And uh, in the meantime, we're going to have a short break with coffee and donuts. I uh, thank you all for your patience. And when you come back, there'll be more great speakers and incredible information. Thank you very much.